How many of y'all have ever been pitching a product to somebody and they say, oh, no, no, that's too expensive? And your first reaction is, okay, let me find something that's not so expensive. Right? It's very easy to do. You're like, oh, okay. Instead of doing that, throw a label in there to be like, it sounds like the value of this product just isn't there for you. Because if you start pitching them another product that doesn't maybe even make sense, they're going to be like, what? It's just, not, it's just not going to end up being the result that you want. So that's a, that's a great example of a negative emotion just festering. You've got you to gotta identify it. it. It's not easy. From, from a sales experience, it's not easy. You, you want to be the peacekeeper or the, the peacemaker, if you will. You have to address it, though. Because maybe, maybe it's not the value that it brings. Maybe they're on a budget that if they exceed it, they're going to get in a lot of trouble. Maybe it's something that you haven't even talked about yet. So just another example of how negatives can, can sit and how to handle them with labels. Yeah. Your subconscious mind is picking up on things before your conscious mind can get it. But if you're in the middle of a conversation, you kind of push that to the back burner. But when you're on the phone and you don't have that visual, you'll focus more on that. And other people that are in the room with you, they'll focus more on that. So trust your subconscious. It's going to be telling you things way in advance before it gets to your conscious brain. There are cultural differences across the world. There are things you should keep in mind when you're dealing with other cultures. But teams in other cultures use this stuff successfully all the time. You know, um, the, 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 the people in China and Japan and, and South Africa and Germany, whatever, they all use, all negotiators are trained the same with these human nature response things that we use. Language translation, I have found, can be a little bit difficult. Um, I had a French client in Canada who had a little bit of trouble because it's, you know, when you're using the basics, it seems like it looks like it sounds like it feels like it doesn't translate very friendly in French. So you kind of have to work around that. But, but there are things you can do. But it, she's right. Human nature response is what you're dealing with. Yeah. And remember, when you're worried about stuff like that, it's a fear that they have. And you can, you can take care of that. When you use a downward inflection, it comes off as a statement. Okay, I understand. You get the understanding. So the upward inflection, you're asking it as a question. Sounds like there's something I'm failing to be sensitive to. And yeah. Or you could... Looks like this is going to work for everyone. Now that's making a statement. So you use the upward inflection if you want to make it a question. In a question form, you use a downward inflection if you want to let them know that, acknowledge that you understand what they're saying. When we're talking in mirrors... He said, he said, can I give an, up, uh, an example of an upward inflection versus a downward inflection? Like, we'll say, like, if, if we're saying mirror the last one, one to three words, and if you want it to be mirror the last one to three words, that's upward. Oh, mirror the last one to three words, I got it. So just the, the way you put the inflection up or down, you're going to be able to, it's going to come off as a question or it's going to come off as pretty much as a statement that I understand, I get it. Heavily negotiating at the police department, what I would do is I would use mirrors when I didn't have enough information to do a deep label. So at the beginning of the conversation, mirror, 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 and then you're like, ah, then you start kind of realizing what's going on and then you can put a decent label out there. Sometimes if you try to label right away, it, it comes across as disingenuous or robotic because you don't really have anything to label. So mirroring right away just makes it easier for you. It's kind of like a nice little crutch to get you more information so that you can do a deeper label. But wow, that's a good question, and I want to, because I was talking with, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Michelle. I was talking with Michelle during the lunch break, and she was asking me, how, you know, how do you know, keep going? Do you keep doing, just keep doing skills, and what, how do you know that you're doing the conversation right? Let me just tell you that we're all human beings, we're having a conversation. That's all you're doing. You're having a conversation. Every single thing out of our mouths is not a black swan skill. Okay? Derek likes to describe it as a stew. Your conversation is this big pot of stew. The skills that we're teaching you are the seasoning. So you toss a little pepper, a little salt, a little garlic. You use them where they fit. You don't force them in. You're still going to be human beings having a conversation. You're still going to ask questions. You're still going to do all the things you already do. But now you're aware of a better way to do it. 
and a better way to get information out of someone without peppering them with questions. And you'll be able to do it successfully when you practice it enough. But you're having a conversation. I tr trust me, you will sound like a robot if everything out of your mouth is a black swan skill. Everyone's going to look at you like, why do you keep, why do you keep doing that? And they're not even going to be able to tell you what it is, but they're going to go, what? Why? why are you doing that? Chris went to a yoga retreat in New York. <laughs> First of all, Chris and Brandon, yoga retreat, that's just ridiculous, no matter how you look at it. And somebody... Um, Found out he was going to be there, so his wife was going. He was like, oh, I'm going to go because, you know, I'm going to see Chris Boss. I'm going to mirror the whole time. They're not going to be, do anything but mirroring the whole time. He became the most interesting person at that yoga retreat. No one knew anything about him, but everyone was coming up to his wife and saying, oh, my gosh, your husband is wonderful. He's like the best person in the world. He's the best listener. He, he has no idea what anyone was even saying to him, but he was mirroring the entire time. So you can do it without it being noticeable. My suggestion to you is take a day and try to do nothing but mirrors. <laughs> um, plus, if you're dealing with an assertive person, and I can say this because I'm assertive, we like to take over the conversation, blah, 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 blah. So we have to breathe at some point. So when you want to gear us where you want us to go to get more information from us, as soon as we go, <gasps> you go, blah, 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 with the mirror, and you'll send me right in that direction. I'll keep talking. You just tell me where you want me to go. And that's how you deal with an assertive person. A lot of people have a problem dealing with assertive people because assertive people will come in and take over. So they have to breathe. When they breathe, that's when you insert a mirror. It doesn't matter where it's from. It can be six sentences back. It's not a thought pattern interrupt. It's not something that's going to cause a problem for them. They already said the words out of their mouth. So it's not going to be a problem for you to say, wait a minute, I want to know more about that and just mirror that. But it does take practice. Mirror, 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 mirror until you have enough to do a really good deep label. If you are purposely putting a dynamic silence out there because you want the other side to formulate something specific to get back to you, you just hang on to that silence. Just sit with it. It's going to suck. You're going to hate it. It's going to be awkward. You're going to be like, oh, gosh, this is, this is going to make you uncomfortable just like it makes them uncomfortable. But people don't like silence. People are uncomfortable with silence. So they want to fill it. This is how I got a lot of confessions. I just sat there. And they're like... Okay, I did it. Like, what? I don't understand. <laughs> um, so people will fill the silence. Uh, if you go longer than 12 seconds, I think Brandon said that's the 12 second mark is what he found now is like the most prevalent. If it goes longer than that and the people are kind of still sitting there like, then you've missed something. Then mm -hmm. you need to go back and address it. Seems like I'm failing to understand something that's important to you. And then go silent again. And then let them tell you what you screwed up and be happy to get the information. Before I tell somebody bad news, you want to bring up all this negative stuff? Yes, that's what we're telling you to do. If you could introduce the negative, half this room wouldn't be here right now. Because at the very beginning, we threw all kinds of audits out at you when this class first started. This is gonna make you uncomfortable. You're going to feel awkward. When the, the people volunteered, this is gonna be the worst thing you've ever done in your life. So if we could introduce those negatives, half of you would have left. Because you don't want to be uncomfortable. You don't want to be put on the spot. You don't want to be awkward. So you would have left. We told you those things. You didn't leave. We introduced the negative. You were like, yep, OK. You dealt with it. Just because we tell you the negative doesn't mean that it's going to ruin everything. OK? Another thing I wanted to point out. I'm going to give you this example because sometimes accusations audits can, can get a little fuzzy. They can get a little confusing. So I'm going to give you a very distinct time that they were used that you can all probably relate to. We've, we've already talked about the fact that I work sex crimes. So when I was a sex crimes detective, we worked a lot of cases of non-stranger sexual assault, meaning they know each other. The famous he, sh he said, I can never say that. It's like Sally in the seashore. He said, she said, they like to blame the victim. So we noticed that a lot of our cases were not actually making it to court. And the ones that did make it to court, we were not getting convictions. We couldn't figure out why it was. So we kind of looked at it. And we said, all right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to start putting all the negative out there first. Because if we do that, it's going to take the wind out of the sails of the defense attorney. They can't use anything against the victim because we already put it out there. And like Barbara said earlier, taking permission and authority away from them to use it against us later. When we stood up in our opening arguments, 
The prosecuting attorney didn't talk about the case. The prosecuting attorney stood up and said, you're not going to like this victim. Pause. You're going to think she was irresponsible. Pause. You're going to wonder why she went home with this guy. Pause. You're going to wonder why she was dressed the way she was. Pause. We, the list went on. It was a robust list. When you're making your list, you should every negative thing you could possibly think about, you should put down. You should be asking yourself, if I was sitting in the chair of my counterpart, what negative things would I be thinking about me and my company and whoever I brought with me and what I'm wearing that day and the fact that I have blonde hair, what, whatever, any negative thing. It can be as mundane and untrue as you can get it, and it doesn't matter. If it's something they could be thinking that's negative, it's important for you to point it out, to mitigate it. So then what happened was, we do that in the opening arguments. We go through the case. Defense attorney had nothing to use against the victim because we literally already put everything negative out there. What we showed them was, we know this looks like a crap case to you, but we're here, we believe in this person, and we're prosecuting it. That sent a message to the jury. It sent them a message of, okay, well, they're here prosecuting it, and they know all these negative things, so they must be okay with it. It must not be anything that makes a difference in the legal case. So, you know, what do you think happened? Wow. Convictions went up like crazy because we ruined the defense case. When you go ahead and put all the negative out there, it can't be used against you later. Okay, that's what we mean by that. So get it out of the way. Don't be afraid to get it out of the way. Don't be afraid to think of all the negative things about yourself because what you're doing when you do that is you're demonstrating to the other side that you understand all the things they're feeling about you and what may be negative. Who does that? Who does? Nobody does that because everyone's afraid to bring up the negative things. Even though they're there and the other side is thinking the negative, when you come out, this is a Jedi mind trick, guys. This is a, where's my Star Wars? Where's my, yeah, this is the closest thing we have to a Jedi mind trick because people are going, oh my gosh, she just said, you know, she just said the victim, the, the, the victim was drunk and she just said what the victim went, oh, yeah, you're right. I do, I do think all those things. 